Good afternoon and welcome to Stoke Downwell Parish Church and which is being held in Stoke Rectory, my own home. Uh, today we keep the liturgy of Good Friday. In normal times the liturgy of Good Friday falls into four sections. That of the liturgy of the Word, where we hear of the ancient promises of God and the writer of the letter of, of the Hebrews and, with, and that culminates in the reading of the Passion from St John. We also have solemn prayers and also then following that there will be brought into the cross into the church a plain cross for the exaltation of the cross after which we would then have uh, the, the uh, taking our own Lord's body and blood from the tabernacle as it had been reserved overnight in the church. However this is not able to happen and so we have a slightly truncated version today in our Good Friday liturgy. First, let us pray. Almighty God, look with mercy on this your family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed and given up into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who is alive and glorified with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first section, the reading of, of the Liturgy of the Word. This opens with a reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human resemblance, and his form beyond that of mortals so he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before, up before him like a young plant, and took and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one whom, from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a la sheep that is before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken from the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light, he shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and has made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Now we hear a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sin and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled, cleansed from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we hear the Passion according to St John. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Jesus brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with their lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked him, For whom are you looking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. They answered, and so Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, asked them For whom are you looking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, answered I have told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfil the word that had been spoken, I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went in with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman, the, the woman said to Peter, You are not also one of these missed man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and were standing around it warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. When the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching, Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, said this, one of the police standing nearby Jesus struck him on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, 
testified to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked him, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not want to now enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfil what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did other tell the others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth, listen to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? And after he had said this, he went out to the Jews and again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone to you at the Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Jesus said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take them him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore the one who has handed me over to you is greater of the, is guilty of the greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at the place of the, of the stone that called the stone pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. 
Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to the what is called the place of the skull, which is in Hebrew called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four lots, one for each soldier. They also found his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfil what the scripture says. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was finished, he said, in order to fulfil the scripture, I am thirsty. So they put a sponge filled or full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed up his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and their bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows what he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he had been crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of Passover, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the Passion of the Lord.
So we hear of the worst things that of human nature, that of betrayal, that of false justice, that of torture and of death and of all the most dreadful things that one human being can do to another. And yet Jesus allows himself to be taken to fulfil the scriptures, to be taken to be crucified and to die, and to be laid into the tomb. His sacrifice of himself upon the cross brought about the ending of all the sacrifices that were required by the Jewish religion. At last, the square had been closed, and at last, the circle had been completed. No more would there be any further need to sacrifice animals for the sins of people. For God himself in the body of Jesus had completed that, uh, that exercise, and that Jesus now had, had won the victory, or was in process of winning the victory. We wait, of course, for uh, tomorrow, and that of the beginning of the Easter celebrations, when we realise that Jesus has been raised to the dead. But at this moment we feel and suffer with the disciples, who see their Lord and Master taken, crucified, died, and then hurriedly buried and put away. How heavy were their hearts. Such anticipation of great things had now been dashed. All that was going to be good was now evil. We live with the coronavirus, this COVID-19, and that we realise that we are in exceptional circumstances. Today, many people are risking their own lives to bring health and healing to those who are very sick. Yesterday, in, on Maundy Thursday, we saw Jesus wash the feet of his disciples as a sign of service. Today, we see his example of sacrifice, the ultimate paying the price of one for another to lay down their life. Sadly, we know many of the health professions, where the doctors, nurses or care assistants have caught this disease through caring for others, and they themselves have, have died subject to that disease. And so we take hope that there are still today people who wish to go and make this world a better place through service and eventually, if required, through sacrifice. In our prayers later on, which now follow this sermon, we have a special moment when we can remember them and all that's come about with this disease. But we, we now leave our Lord in the tomb, where miraculous things will take place. But at this moment, we align ourselves with those who are sick, for those who are suffering, and especially for those who mourn and are bereaved. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We come now to our solemn prayers. And in our solemn prayers of intercession, they fall into three short sections. There is the introduction, there is a prayer, and then there is a collect. God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Therefore we pray to our Heavenly Father for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Church of God throughout the world, for unity in faith, in witness and in service, for bishops and other ministers, and for those whom they serve, for Robert, our bishop, and the people of this diocese, for all Christians in our parish, and for those to be baptised, for those who are mocked and persecuted for their faith, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase its love, and preserve it in peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Almighty God, whose mighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is governed and sanctified, 
Hear our prayer for which we offer for all your faithful people, that in their vocation and ministry they may serve you in holiness and truth to the glory of your name. Through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for the nations of the world and their leaders. For Elizabeth, our Queen, and for the parliaments of this land and those who administer the law and all who serve in public office, for all who strive for justice and reconciliation, that by God's help the world may live in peace and freedom. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Most, wise, most gracious God and Father, in whose will is our peace, turn our hearts and the hearts of all, your, of all to yourself, that by the power of your Spirit, the peace which is founded on justice may be established throughout the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us pray for God's ancient people, the Jews, the first to hear his word, for a greater understanding between, between Christians and Jew, and the removal of our blindness and bitterness of heart, that God will grant us his grace to be faithful to his covenant and to grow in the love of his name. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Lord God of Abraham, bless the children of your covenant, both Jew and Christian. Take from us all blindness and bitterness of heart, and fast and hasten the coming of your kingdom, when the Gentiles shall be gathered in, all Israel shall be saved, and we shall dwell together in mutual love and peace under the one God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe in the Gospel of Christ, for those who have not heard the message of salvation, for all who have lost their faith, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of Christ and persecute those who follow him. For all who deny the faith of Christ crucified, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Merciful Father, creator of all the people of the earth, have compassion on all who do not know you and by the preaching of your gospel with grace and power, gather them into the one fold of the one shepherd, Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let us pray for all those who suffer, for those who are deprived and, op and oppressed, for all who are sick, for those in darkness, in doubt and in despair, in loneliness and in fear, for prisoners, captives and refugees, for the victims of fourth accusations and violence, for all at the point of death and those who will watch beside them, that God in his mercy will sustain them with the knowledge of his love. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Almighty and everlasting God, the comfort of the sad, the strength of those who suffer, hear the prayers of your children who cry out in any trouble, and to every distressed soul grant mercy, relief and refreshment, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us pray also for all those who suffer the consequences of the current pandemic, that God the Father may grant health to the sick, strength to those who care for them, comfort to the families and salvation to the victims who have died. Lord, hear us. 
Lord, graciously hear us. Almighty and ever-living God, only support of our human weakness, look with compassion upon the sorrowful condition of your children who suffer because of this pandemic. Relieve the pain of the sick, give strength to those who care for them, welcome into your peace those who have died, and throughout this time of tribulation, grant that we may all find comfort in your merciful love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us commend ourselves and all God's children to his unfailing love and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have died in the peace of Christ we may come to the fullness of eternal life and the joy of the resurrection. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look mercifully upon your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, and by the tranquil operation of your perpetual providence carry out the work of our salvation, and let the whole world feel and see that, that things which were cast down are being raised up, and that things which have grown old are being made new, and that all things are returning to perfection through him from whom they took their origin, even Jesus Christ our Lord. With you who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Standing at the foot of the cross, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, set your passion cross and death between our judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Grant mercy and grace to the living, rest to the departed, and to your church peace and concord, and to us sinners forgiveness, and the everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you are alive and reign, God, now and forever. Amen. Well, we now in the church, we would uh, uh, now leave the place in silence, as the church would be a tomb. And yet, we know that God is working his salvation through, and that tomorrow, on the Holy Saturday, we can celebrate our Lord's resurrection. Peace be with you. Amen.